So um, yesterday we spent a lot of time learning about the biology and the physical aspects of weight loss. And I want to preface by saying that I am not an obesity expert or a metabolics expert. I am a scientist who works in a group at Johnson & Johnson. And what we do is we study um, behavior change in human performance. And so I want to <coughs> introduce you today to a concept um, known as energy, the way we think about energy. And it's not exactly the same energy that we talked about yesterday in terms of metabolics. It's the kind of energy that we all feel. It's that energy at three o'clock in the afternoon that tells you, gosh, I really need a cup of coffee right now. It's that kind of energy that I want to talk to you a little bit about. And I want to ask you, do you want more energy? Do you need more energy? Who, who doesn't, right? And if you had more energy, what would you do with it? And what happens, I know, <laughs> it'd be wonderful, right? <laughs> and what happens when we don't have energy? Nothing happens. Nothing moves without energy. So we spend our time in our group thinking about questions like this. What fuels and drives people to make and sustain change? Particularly the type of change that's hard, that's difficult to do, or the type of change that doesn't come with an immediate or perceivable end benefit, something you feel right away. So it's a challenge, it's a challenge that we face. And the law of Newton's first law of physics tells us that a body at rest will stay at rest until it's acted <coughs> on by force, right? And you know, this is kind of thought of in terms of movement, physical movement, but it can be any type of, of movement. It could be um, emotional change or uh, um, mental change. So in other words, what is that force that we need to m help us make those physical or mental changes necessary. So we, this is a challenge that we're continually going to face with human behavior is how do you get people to change as we develop our interventions. So when we think about um, different concepts and different thing, concepts of change, you know, one, one concept is this idea that John mentioned yesterday around delayed discounting. And delayed discount, what it tells us is that human nature likes to delay um, rewards, uh, or, or doesn't like to delay rewards. So they don't want to put off what they can get tomorrow in terms of in, in sacrificing get it today. So if I do something, I expect to feel something, to get something immediately in return. Um, and then you think about um, you know, motivation and what motivates people. And this idea that you, know, you would think that weight loss would be very motivating to people. But the problem is when you, and you ask people, you survey people, and most of them will tell you, the vast majority will say, yes, I do want and need to, to lose weight. But the problem is that this type of motivation, it usually comes from external factors. So what's known as extrinsic motivation. So the idea of, I want to lose weight because I want to look good in my bikini this summer. And the issue with this type of motivation is that it's often not sustainable for the long term. So... This is the challenge, and the challenge that we have as well is that concepts like health, health are not, you know, health is so big. Becoming healthy is such a big, ambiguous, amorphous concept, and oftentimes that's not inherently motivating for people. So what we want to propose, what I want to propose, is this idea of, of energy. And our thesis is that energy can be a powerful enabler to motivation particularly the type of motivation <coughs> that's internally driven. So this idea of I just, I'm looking for a little bit of more energy to be able to do more of the things that really mean and matter a lot to me, the things that are most important to me, this idea of intrinsic motivation. So focusing on that. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a context of who we are and where we're coming from at, at Johnson & Johnson. So about five years ago or so, Johnson & Johnson acquired a small company out in uh, Orlando, Florida, known as the Human Performance Institute. And what they've been doing for the past 30 years is trying to understand high performance. And they develop training programs for high performance. And they train um, elite athletes, and they train top-level C-suite execs and CEOs, military personnel, first responders, these types of people. And they've been doing this for 30 years. Um, they have an interesting history. So they were founded by two guys, Dr. Jim Lair and um, Dr. Jack Grapple, a psychologist and a physiologist. <coughs> and they really started in sport. And they really wanted to understand elite athletes and sport and performance. And what constitutes 
optimal high, you know, high performance and how do you optimize performance? How do you get these athletes to perform even better? So since then, they've applied the same principles of energy and energy recovery into the business world because they've learned that high performance is a very important skill in that realm as well. So they've translated these ideas, these principles and these courses around energy management out to other high performance um, aspects. And that's what I wanted to um, cover a little bit today and some of the principles there. So why energy? Why are we so fascinated and interested in energy? Because energy is a valuable resource and it, it's continuously depleted. Throughout our days, we deplete our energy and it's something that we all need and want. When we surveyed hundreds of employees, the vast majority tells us, told us that they're interested in increasing, very, very interested in increasing their energy. Not a surprise, right? And this is reflected in the uh, marketplace. If you look at the quick fix energy types of products, foods and beverages, it's a booming business and it's not slowing down anytime soon. So this really shows you the vast need. But I wanna start first with talking a little bit, a bit about time versus energy because the biggest excuse that people give as to why they don't engage with healthy behavior is, I don't have time, I'm too busy for this, I don't have time. But here's the issue, what I wanna really discuss with you, is it time that's the problem or is it energy? Is it that people just don't have the energy to do it? And I wanna challenge this and I wanna talk about energy a little bit more because when you look at energy throughout the day, um, and we've measured um, energy throughout the day in a number of different populations now. Here I'm showing employees at three different companies. We've looked at other populations since. But, so we've measured energy, and we measured throughout the day using a couple different methodologies. But what blows me away is consistently we always see the same pattern, no matter who we, who we um, look at. We start, what happens is we start our days off at fairly high energy, and as the day goes by, our energy drains. And so here's a very typical curve, conceptualized curve. And look what happens at the end of the day. At the end of the day, we end up drained. And what happens is we don't end up bringing our best selves back home, back to our friends, back to our families, right? Or even back for ourselves, to be able to do the things that are important to us, that nurture us. So here's the problem. And let me ask you, if you had the choice between having more time or more energy, which would you choose? Both. Right? Both. <laughs> I know, right? Well, yeah. We don't if get only. Time, though, if so only. We know those trick questions from yesterday. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Forgot about that. We conditioned you. <laughs> People yes. usually say energy, yes. but. <laughs> um, so I want to do a, a quick little exercise. Um, as you're sitting here, I want to ask you just to think about where is your energy right now? Where do you fall? And give it a number from zero to 10. Zero being the lowest energy you've ever felt, 10 being the highest energy you've ever felt. Where are you today, right now, as you're sitting here right now? Give it a number, we'll come back to it later. Okay, so going back to time versus energy. So time is linear. Time goes ticking away at a linear, constant pace, and there's nothing we can do to change that. But while time is linear, energy is not. And the power in this is that it's not about how much time you have. It's about how much energy you have and how much energy you put into the limited time that you do have. So if you think about it, think about how much um, cleaning you can get done, right, in the 10 minutes before someone shows up. You can get a lot of cleaning done <laughs> before then. Or how much writing you get done the night before a big deadline, right? There you go. So if you put, there you go, now you can relate. <laughs> um, so the idea is if you had the energy and you knew how to focus it, it doesn't matter how much time you had because you, you could optimize it that way. So it's not about the, the time and the energy. It's all more about the energy. And so what is energy and how do we define energy? Because it's kind of a, a difficult concept. So if you look at the physics definition of energy, it's the capacity to do work. So we've taken that definition and we've elaborated on it a little bit. And the way we define it is the feeling of vitality, vigor, zest, whatever adjective you want to put to it, but it's this feeling, right? Along with a perceived capacity to initiate and sustain activity. So this idea of to do work. So that's kind of our stake in the ground definition. We're still working on it <laughs> to try to define this. Um, and the way we conceptualize and we teach energy at the Human Performance Institute, we say that energy 
exists on a variety of different dimensions. Now, whether they're four dimensions or six or two, we can debate that, but it's multidimensional. And so there's the physical dimension, um, which is pretty much the, the foundation. And this is how we refuel our tanks. So things like getting enough sleep, eating right, being physically active, those all fall within the physical dimension. But I want to make the point that energy is multidimensional. And you can drain and recapture energy in different dimensions. So for example, emotional energy. This is the idea of resilience. The idea to be able to um, bounce back after taking an emotional hit and, and maintaining a positive attitude. Or the uh, mental energy, this idea of laser focus, particularly in our multitasking world. So the idea of being laser focused or in the zone, that's the idea of mental energy. And spiritual energy at the top, Spiritual just simply connotes being mission-driven, being aligned to a purpose, whatever that purpose happens to you, to be you. That has a lot of power to it and a lot of energy. So the idea of energy, it can, it, it, like we were talking about before, it's constantly depleted. It's a precious resource. So energy expenditure must be balanced with energy recovery. So this is a really important concept that you have to live in an oscillatory way in terms of energy. You constantly have to replenish as you deplete. And athletes know this. So many, many years ago, athletes really optimize on this principle through the concepts of micro, um, um, micro cycles and periodization. So if you think about it with athletes, they know that you need stress as a stimulus to growth, but you also need to balance this with recovery. So in terms of muscle building, right, you stress, and then you recover. You stress, and then you recover. And this is how um, athletes improve their performance. And the idea is the same um, in life as well. And so the idea being that you need to be able to disengage from your, what you're doing and come back to it and re-engage for optimal performance. So let me give you an example. If I were to ask you to take a 10-pound dumbbell and hold it over your head for 20 minutes straight, it'd be pretty difficult, right? But then if I said, okay, here, do it this way instead. Take the dumbbell, hold it for five minutes, and recover. Five minutes and recover. Now it's more doable. The same thing, it doesn't have to be just physical. The same thing, um, the same concepts work for your brain as well. So I'm sure you've had the experience when you're working on something and you just, ah, oh, there's a thought you couldn't remember or a cost of a puzzle, and you put it down, you walk away, and then you come back and, up. Oh, there it goes, it just popped in your head. You didn't get smarter <laughs> in that time period, right? It's that your body needs recovery throughout. And recovery, what's fascinating about recovery is that it doesn't take very long, it can take seconds. So I wanted to tell you a little bit of, uh, a little story around tennis, going back to sport. So um, what Jim Lair did many, many years ago, he studied tennis. And he looked at videos from elite tennis players and wanted to understand what makes these elite tennis players so special. And he studied these videos. And what he found was 35% of the time was used uh, with, uh, during a match. These, game, these uh, athletes were actually hitting. So 35% of the time, they were playing the game. 65% of the time was used in, in between points or in changeover. So the majority. And some, act, some people actually think that the matches are won in these time frames in between points, and it's not so much the physical play. And so what's going on there? Um, when he studied these videos, what he found was consistently in these elite tennis players, in those 20 seconds in between points, consistently these players went through four distinct phases. And so what was happening there, not to go into many details, because I'm not an expert there, so I'll mess it up anyway. Um, <laughs> what's happening, he, so he coined this the 16-second uh, cure for tennis. And what he says was, was that in these seconds in between points, this is when these athletes take the time to both mentally and physically recover. And this is super important in the game because tennis is an incredibly physical game. They go for four to five hours straight to, in one match, and it's high intensity, it's high interval um, um, intensity. Their heart rates apparently are at 150 beats per minute throughout four or five hours. So it's an incredibly physically intense game. So these 20 seconds in between points are critical for not only the physical recovery, but the mental recovery. So if you watch a tennis match and you watch the rituals that these guys do in between points, it's fascinating. They always you know, do the, the same rituals, whatever it might be for them, and, all, and it, 
it's purposeful and intentional because not only are they getting the physical recovery, it's a mental recovery, a reboot that they're doing. And, and there's four phases that they go through. And this, he's found, is the secret to high performance, at least in tennis. So it's interesting. Recovery doesn't have to take long, but it's important that it happen. Um, so we were, yes. what were the four stages? Oh, you gosh. You said they went to four stages. They did, so I'm going to try to Sorry. not mess it up. Um, okay. There was an idea of, okay, so you do, you do your point, and then you have to either celebrate. So if they, if they won the point, they're like, yes. yes. They, they do some kind of either celebratory motion uh -huh. or oh, shake it off, if shake it off motion. And then the second phase, I think, was um, the way they walked back. So they call it the matador walk. It's kind of like a psych up. Yeah, okay, I got this next time type of thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then there was the ritual. So some kind of physical ritual, whether they wipe the sweat or whether they spin the racket. Um, and then it's the setup. So mentally now they're preparing the fourth phase is, okay, they psych themselves up. Here's their, they visualize what they want the ball to do and what this next set is going to look like. And it's a visualization exercise. I think, I hope I didn't uh -huh. mess that up, but I think those are the four phases. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. So we started to think about this concept of recovery. And it's one part of the, the energy management course. But if recovery could happen through small bits of rest, then or disengagement, could there be equal gain in energy? Could it work the opposite way? So could there be equal gain in energy through intentional activities, so intentional investing of energy, such as exerting a little energy, doing small bits of motion or other dimensions to get more energy back? So I'm going to go through this a little bit in depth because um, that led us to um, the idea of the microburst. So microburst is a word that we coined, and it's kind of caught on. It's, it's catchy. Um, but really what we're trying to say here is micro simply means something small. So a small intentional investment of energy, a small intentional activity that you do to get more energy back. And I like the word burst because it connotes more energy. So it's the idea of one to two minutes that you can um, invest in recovery to get more energy back. So what is the problem with the concept of microburst? The problem is that we as humans are oscillatory beings, right? We saw that yesterday with the way our metabolics work. Um, we see that, you know, with all our systems, our EKGs, EEGs, you know, you name it. We live, diurnal rhythms, we live biologically in an oscillatory kind of vessel, right? Um, but we're forced to live in this environment. Our world is linear, right? We're forced to live in this environment that's nonstop, go, 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 and it requires us to be engaged fully on at long periods of times with no rest. And that's the problem, that we're trying to force fit our natural biology into a, a linear world and not allowing ourselves for recovery. So that's the issue that we're having. So the idea of a microburst is simply take one to two minutes to disengage. No matter what you're doing throughout your day, this disengagement or recovery is really important and really critical. So I want to talk about a little bit about, show you some data about what we mean, just to give it a little bit more, um, make it more concrete. So we did some experiments, and we asked employees at work to, um, when they're feeling particularly tired in the day, to do a quick physical microburst of activity. So what we had them do was get up, and just five minutes, we timed them. Five minutes, go up and down the stairwell, at an easy pace, and they weren't <laughs> sprinting and sweating. It's just five minutes, really casually. Um, and, and then we measured their energy and we tracked their energy over the next hour. And no surprise, and if you do this, you'll feel it yourself, no surprise, after five minutes, they felt a big burst of energy, a surge of energy, and you feel it. But what was a surprise to me, and I didn't expect, I expected energy to go down, but I didn't expect this to happen. So an hour later, people were still reporting double the amount of energy, an hour later. And all they did was five minutes of stairs, that's it. So this is the idea of the microburst. Something small that you do, simple five minutes, that gives you a big return in energy at the end. So it goes beyond just energy. And Dr. Levine's going to show you some fascinating research that he's done and his colleagues have done. But I'll touch on a couple of things here. What Rady has done is um, he's shown that the, when the body moves, the brain responds. The brain lights up. And this is after a 20-minute walk. But Bolo and colleagues did an experiment <coughs> with, where they just looked within the first couple um, seconds or minutes after physical activity and they found a hyperexygenation happening in the brain. That the brain really responds to motion immediately. And so 
what else happens besides the brain? I mean, there, what, what we're seeing is that short bouts of physical activity in here about 10 minutes or so has also been associated with improved vigor, mood, self-control, cognition, creativity. And it's interesting that engaging in short bouts, seem, bouts of activity seem to have an added effect. So doing multiple throughout the day seem to be really good, um, just as good, some say, as doing it in consecutively all at once. So John um, <coughs> showed you this data, uh, this study yesterday, and I just wanted to repeat it because I really like this one. This is Patel's work again. Um, and I just want to make the point here, it's interesting, and we can almost start to think, well, are, do we have it flipped backwards? So you know, everyone talks about activity, activity, activity. And I wonder if we need to instead focus on amount of inactivity, how long we spend consecutively inactive or sitting. And so what, what he's found here is that um, he's looked at mortality rates in a large perspective <coughs> study. And he found, just like John said yesterday, a higher mortality rate for those who spent a longer time of their day sitting. Um, and what was interesting is even if they worked out, so even if they thought they were doing the right thing going to the gym early in the morning, um, if they spent the rest of their day sitting, it wasn't doing them, um, it, was it was a disservice. So that's really interesting. So what I want to do, <laughs> I can't let you sit here any longer, <laughs> which we are conscious. So if you all would indulge me, we're just going to get up. I know we don't have a lot of room, and I'm not going to finish. I'm going to keep presenting because I have more stuff to talk about. <laughs> um, so I just get up and stretch and wiggle. I want to get the blood going. So usually when I do this, I have people march in place, but just wiggle around, squirm around, and I'll, I'll keep talking um, and tell you a little bit about, <laughs> um, tell you uh, some of our work that we did with New Balance, the sneaker company. And we've done this with a, a couple different com companies now. <laughs> Sorry. I'm like a right in the middle that. of the screen. <laughs> So we put together a program called Organizations in Motion. And so what this program was, so this is our energy curve. This is our typical energy curve. Um, I'm going to keep wiggling around too. <laughs> um, so what happens? We asked ourselves, well, what could happen if we simply took and strung together a bunch of microbursts throughout the day? So every hour, what could happen if you got up and you actually um, did a microburst, five minutes, a couple minutes of stretching or up and down stairs throughout the day, and you did this consistently. And the question we had was, could you change this curve? Could you shift this curve? So we tested this, um, this program in a couple of different companies, and I'll show you New Balance's data. So here's their energy curve initially before, and here's what happened. So lo and behold, in fact, we did shift their curve. What we saw was a significant increase in energy throughout their work day. Um, and so this was interesting, and all they did, and mind you, we weren't advocating breaks, and I want to make this, this is an important point, that it's not about taking multiple breaks throughout the day, because this gets people really nervous at companies. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about that, it's, and it, we're not taking a break right now. <laughs> um, it's about just, and, and so the, when we implemented this program, we would facilitate, we would send them an email with some, you know, today, why don't you try this, or um, it was a very simple execution of it. Um, but the thought was it would be stretching exercises, so stretch, you know, during your work day, or um, catch up with a colleague while walking for five minutes outside, or you know, little simple things that they do. Stand up in the back of a meeting. You know, you ever sit in a meeting, a long meeting, and you start to get really tired. Here's a good trick: just get up and stand up in the back. That'll get your blood going, and it'll kind of give you a little bit more energy and focus. So what what was interesting here is not only did their energy go up, but what we found, what they also reported was an improvement in performance. They thought they performed better. They thought they were more focused. Um, and we saw an improvement in intrinsic motivation, that good kind of motivation that's, um, that comes from inside. OK. What, can you ask? <laughs> <laughs> now you can sit down. I like that instruction. That was very cute. <laughs> that, that sure. You can still sit down if you want to. <laughs> What, are, what is the scale on the left? What are, what are the numbers? Required? Yeah, so this comes from a, a validated um, scale. It's the, I forget what it's called. The uh, uh, I don't have it in my I, notes I'm, here. I'm trying to figure out the difference between 15.9 and 16.3. I, I don't know. Yeah, so this is a validated scale. Um, it's a self-report scale. And it measures the balance um, between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. And I do believe that this was statistically significant. And I can't remember. It's a scoring. So there's some positive items and negative items that you balance. I can forward it to you. I don't have it off the top of my head Thanks. if you're interested. Yes. OK. 
So I want to talk a little bit more about these microbursts because I've been talking a lot about the physical. And the physical is just easier to, to talk about and, and, and demonstrate. But I want to go back to the multidimensionality of energy. And it goes beyond just the physical. So I'll show you another series of studies that we did. So we asked employees. We monitored the energy level of employees at work. And we asked them, what is your energy right now? And we also asked them, what were the activities you were doing in the 30 minutes before you reported your energy? Because we wanted to understand kind of what... What, um, what led to the number that they reported. So here's what we did. We took all the activities that they reported and we plotted them on a line graph and we took averages and we saw that the type of activities that associated with lower energy were very typical workplace activities. They were, <laughs> I was in a meeting, I was on a conference call, no surprise, right? And we looked at the other side of the scale, the type of activities that people reported that associated with the higher energy were things like um, physical activity, but we were very specific, 10 minutes or less. So they, didn't, they weren't going to the gym. They were probably just walking around the office. Or strategic recovery activities like stretching, that sort of thing. Or this was a little bit of a surprise, having a conversation with a loved one. So this is an important point that I wanted to make here. It doesn't always have to be physical. That the emotional piece has just as much power, if not more, um, than the physical. So there's, you can recover and you can do little microbursts on the emotional realm or the mental realm or other, other dimensions like having a conversation with a loved one. So we cannot talk about energy without talking about our good friend coffee, right? <laughs> <laughs> Where does he fit in? <laughs> so we looked at that. Of all the people who had reported that they had drank a cup of coffee in the 30 minutes before giving us their energy number, we averaged. And so the average of coffee was a 6.8. What's interesting is that the average of strategic recovery or physical activity was a 7.4. But that's an emotional judgment. It's, it's self-perceived. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so you bring up a really good point, and that's the challenge in this field. How do you measure energy? Because we can't really take a, a meter <laughs> and stick it on a person and measure. So it is subjective, it is subjective. And we're working on, on that right now and how to develop a more validated scale. So right now, the way we've been measuring is right, you know, like this, zero to 10 scale, just like I asked you. So how much better than coffee was it? Coffee was the 6.8 <laughs> and this was the 7.4. And it was a statistical <laughs> difference. Um, but to your point, it's all perception. But what I found was, you know, I, I did some experiments too to kind of pseudo validate the scale. And I had people um, take a caffeine pill. So a 100 milligram caffeine pill that they ingested, um, which is equivalent to a cup of coffee. It's not a lot of caffeine. And I measured their energy. And so you have this curve. I mean, you, you swallow the pill and it takes a while to metabolize and then it's like this. Um, and I compared that to in the literature, there was a study who did this similar thing, had people ingest. Um, caffeine and looked at their blood plasma levels of caffeine. Same kinetics, right? So it seems like people are pretty attuned to their self-perceived energy. Yeah. A question: um, When when you um, measured the cup of coffee, yes, um, would that include like if they added sugar to it? Yeah, that's a good question. So we weren't that specific. Yeah. So we asked people give right now. You know, we would ping people throughout the day. What is your energy level right now? And they'd say, I'm a seven. And we'd say, okay, what, here's a list of activities. Um, what were you doing in the last 30 minutes? And they would tick off. So all we said was having a caffeinated beverage, actually. It wasn't even specifically coffee. We said caffeinated. So we didn't get into detail. Yeah, I was yeah. just wondering the difference if, it, if, if, yeah. there would, if they would just take that pill yeah. as opposed to having coffee with sugar. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's exactly why we went back and then we did a, a experiment with the pill. Because what I found was... Um, I did some other experiments after that, and I had people, um, <laughs> I, um, I bribe people to be in my study because I said, I'll make a Starbucks run, you tell me what you want, I'll get it for you, but be in my study and tell me your energy throughout the day. So what I found was, the, the hard way, <laughs> is that everyone wanted something different, and, um, but the even bigger factor is some people gulp their coffee and some people take a, an hour to drink it, and that really kind of messed with the data. So that's why I kind of threw all that out and said, okay, I'm just gonna have people take a pill because everyone takes it right away. And so we, now we have the nice kinetics um, with the caffeine pill. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So if you, but if you did a, those, that brain scan was pretty you know, interesting. But we didn't so, do that work, but, yeah. But, right, but it would seem that that's, that that's sort of physical proof is to do scans. 
It can be. I, I guess that's kind of hard to do. Yeah, no, it can be for perceived energy. I mean, it, it all goes back to, um, you know, energy is kind of a multifactorial thing. So what is, what is leading people to perceive energy? What makes you feel? So certainly um, movement and oxygenation to the brain could be one. Um, we know we've done some experiments with food um, and, uh, you know, energy bars, for example. And we know that they um, give people a perception of energy after some time, after they kind of... So I think with food, it's, it's complicated too because um, there is the mood benefit that you get because it tastes yummy, but then you also the sugar level that rises. So I actually don't know. It's purely speculative. This is kind of outside of my area of expertise. Um, and we've done a lot of experiments to try to tease that out, but I think we have a long way to go and try to understand energy. And that's what we're, tr we're doing now is how do you best measure energy? Can, yes. can I just make the point that it seems sure. like with energy, it's almost like perception is reality. Exactly. Because if you feel more energetic, then you're more energetic. It is it is. I mean, it's kind of, yeah. you know, it's almost self-defined. Oh, exactly. So. Exactly. Yeah, so it's this challenge. I mean, do you look for a biological marker or do you just say, it's too complicated to simplify to one Both. singular. Both. Both. I answered everything. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard about the one minute meditation. Have no, I have it? not. It's really fan fantastic. Oh, I need to look into and, it because it goes along with this. It's absolutely <laughs> in line with this. You can just look it up. Oh, but thank yeah, you. This, is, this man's theory that, you know, just taking one minute yeah. makes such a I difference. That it. And that's all you need. That reboot. So. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's I'd love great. to look into that. Yeah. I'm curious about sure. something. Uh, yeah. Did all the participants in your experiment sleep at least eight hours a night? Good <laughs> question. So we did ask um, about sleep. I didn't fully analyze that. I think it, it's an interesting question, and it's a whole other Pandora's box and complexity that we just haven't delved into, to be honest. We have the data. We need to kind of rummage through it. It's complicated. So definitely ener or sleep is linked to energy, for sure. Um, we actually studied moms of young babies, zero to six month old babies, and we, we had two cells, babies that were good sleepers and babies that were not sleeping very well. And we tracked the energy and we looked at the energy of mom and we asked, asked their sleep. That is one population where the energy, you know, this nice curve, is all messed up. These moms <laughs> with yeah. the young babies, they don't look so... <laughs> they're, pretty they're pretty messed up. <laughs> we'll have our own test subject. Yeah, exactly. In a couple of weeks. <laughs> So I don't know enough about it. I mean, absolutely, yeah. there's something there we need to we need to learn more. Yeah, because yeah. in my case, when I don't speak, uh, sleep well, yeah. mm -hmm. then during the day I'm completely drained, and even though I drank, you know, the energy stuff and yeah. coffee, it, it doesn't work. Exactly. So. No, I hear you. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So I want to go back to um, the bigger concept of health and motivation because microbursts are fun to talk about, but let's talk about you know, what does it mean in a bigger way. Um, so when we talk about health, because <laughs> it's something that you know, we focus on in health and wellness programs, it's such a big concept. And when you approach people with such a big concept, they're really quick. We all have really good stories that we could tell as to why we don't do the things that we know we should. Lots of stories that we tell ourselves, right? And I think the problem is that these concepts are so big. And so the thought is, what if we just change the conversation? What if instead of talking about health, we start just talking about energy? Something that's immediate. Um, so this idea that just you know, do something because it gives you more energy in return. It's immediate, it's instant gratification. And I wanted to talk about some work that Robert Thayer did many, many years ago. So he, many, 20, 30 years ago or so or more, he actually did a lot of work in terms of energy and physical activity and mood. And one of the things, one of the studies um, and questions that he had was what makes people different? So you have a set of people that go to the gym regularly. They're constantly going to the gym and they're consistent and these devotees, yeah? So what makes them different? <laughs> what makes you tick? What ma then from people who go in January and then they quit, right? Which is probably most of us, me. <laughs> so what's the difference between the two populations? So when he studied them, what he found was, lo and behold, the people that went to the gym regularly, <coughs> the reason they gave was simply, they made me feel good. That's why I go. They say feel good. I walk out, I have more energy, I feel good. That's it. There's no magic. They weren't going there to fit into a bikini. They weren't going there for um, anything else that just makes them feel good. So this idea of something instant, instant gratification, going back to the delayed discounting. And that's why we feel that energy has this power to it. Because not only is it instant, 
but I think it has potential to build and build into something bigger like health. So here's the vision. What if we could build a self-perpetuating cycle? So what if we just simply get the ball rolling? Because it's hard that inertia, Newton's first law, it's hard to get people to start. So what if we get them just these small microbursts, do something little to give you a little bit of energy back, right? That could then lead to something more. So what if you, you did some, some microbursts and you show up at home with a little bit of extra energy and now you have more time or you're, you're more engaged with your kids, right? You bring more energy home. And then the next day, you did a little bit more. You come home with more energy and you decide, hey, I'm going to take the dog for a walk. And then the next day, you go home and you decide, you know what, I'm going to do one extra block today or, you know, around the block. So the idea is, what if this just builds? And so what's powerful about this is energy is also linked to internal, this idea of intrinsic motivation. So what if you do some things to give you a little bit of extra energy to allow you to do more of the things that you love? of the things that you value, that mean the most to you. Because inherently, it's those things that are um, energizing, that fuel us in and of themselves. So you get more energy out of those. So you can see how this can start to build into a self-perpetuating cycle. So I want to end with here one last case study, and this is my favorite. Um, you know, besides working with athletes and um, CEOs and employees, um, one challenge that we had was, you know, how can we get and broaden this and make this bigger and scale it and bring it into people's homes? And we decided to really focus on mothers because mothers are very near and dear to our hearts at Johnson & Johnson. We love moms. <laughs> and, um, you know, moms are often the nucleus of the family. So we had this hypothesis that if you can get moms to engage in healthier behaviors, it will transpect. And it will affect her husband, her kids, her family. And so we wanted to test this hypothesis out. And so we, um, and this is the idea, could we bring this concept into people's homes? So we partnered with an organization called Moms in Motion. They're a fairly small organization. They're wonderful. And what they are is a, a, fitness, um, a fitness club. So what they do is they bring together moms in their communities around a common goal. So they decide, they get together and they're going to train for a set amount of time with the goal of running a race, like a 5K, and they do this together. And what we did is we took our energy management program and we integrated it into their fitness training program, and we did a, um, we, we launched this new hybrid program. So we took five teams from the east and west coast, 124 moms total, and you can see that these moms were very typical Average women, their average weight was around 150 pounds, average BMI 25, um, all kinds of different various ages and, and um, kids of all ages. And they self-reported fit. So most of these moms had already been part of Moms in Motion. So they were already doing good, they were health conscious, they were already working out multiple times a week. So they self-reported pretty fit. Um, they thought they were pretty, they were doing pretty well and they were. Um, so here's what we did with them. We put them through a 10-week curriculum, each team. And here was the structure. So they get together once a week, usually Saturday morning, uh, with their team, and they train out in a park. And every week, we gave them access to our self-directed e-course, or our energy management program. We have an um, online version of it. And we gave them access to that. And every week, we gave them homework. So much like a book club. You know, this week, look at, you know, chapter one. And then they get together on Saturday and they train and they discuss chapter one and they would go on for the 10 weeks. What they also got as a part of the program was support products. So for each module, we handed out samples of things to help them live into the principles that they happen to be learning about. So if they were learning about um, healthy eating and snacking, we gave them some samples of snack foods. If they were learning about you know, when they were crafting their mission, they're going through the module of crafting a mission statement, we gave them post-it notes so they can kind of put their mission up where they want to as a reminder. So simple little products as tools. They also had access to a mobile app that we created to help with their training, you know, the training that they use, much like the seven minute, you know, throughout the week, um, and an energy tracker. So um, this was originally built as a data acquisition tool. We would ping them throughout the day and ask, what's your energy right now? So we'd have some data and see how energy moves. So that's what it would look like. And so mission is really important to our program. It's core to our program and it starts with mission. And so we have exercises to help them craft their personal mission statement. And when we took and analyzed 
these mom, the mom's um, mission statements, here's what we found. We found some consistent themes. So consistently, the reason why, what was fueling these women, were the concepts of family, being your best self, and being a role model. Being a role model for their family and kids. This is what was driving. And you can notice nowhere on there do they talk about weight. And the data, the outcomes were astounding. Um, so we measured outcomes midway at five weeks and then at the end, at the end after they ran their race at 10 weeks. And what we found was that even though mom's emotion never talks about weight or weight loss, it's just not their, part of their program. Their program is to get them fit enough to run a 5K. Um, or our program never mentions weight. Half of our moms ended up as a side effect losing some weight. Not a lot, but some. Um, energy was our primary outcome. And so we measured energy a variety of different ways because like I said, there isn't a tried and true <laughs> way to measure energy. So we really wanted to nail this and understand what was going on. So what we found was let me see, no, that we saw an improvement in energy throughout the day. Every point improved. But particularly the biggest effect was 34% increase in energy in the evenings, which I find really spectacular because now this is the energy that they're bringing home to their families. We also saw a significant improvement in quality of life and quality of health, which these traditionally these constructs are pretty hard to move with an intervention. What we saw, we measured stress and mood, and we saw improvements both in stress levels. Stress levels declined and mood improved across a variety of different mood states. We looked at sleep, I mean, going back to sleep. So what's interesting about sleep, we looked at sleep quality um, and total sleep time. And Mom's Emotion never talks about sleep. And our program covers sleep but very superficially. We don't really talk much about sleep. We just say sleep is important for energy. But it's interesting that going through this type of program, we saw a significant improvement in sleep, um, both sleep time and sleep quality, which I didn't expect. We also saw an improvement of all types of um, health-related behaviors across the board. These are the types of things that we teach and advocate in the program. And then we saw an improvement in motivation. So at the end, these women were saying that they're now more motivated to manage their energy, which is no surprise, but manage their stress, take care of themselves, <coughs> be more healthy. The only thing that didn't improve was the motivation to take care of their family. Well, they're mothers after all, right? <laughs> they're really pretty motivated to take care of their family all along. And their satisfaction improved across the board. And what was really great to see is that after they ended the program, 88% of them reported that they're going to continue continue to work on energy management, continue. And I've had a, a number of these moms ask me, can I still keep the e-course on? You're not going to turn it off on me because we're going to continue meeting and continue doing this, which is phenomenal to see. But my favorite outcomes are not the ones we measured, but the ones we heard. So throughout the program, we heard many stories. And our hypothesis really held true, this idea that it will transfect, and it will affect not only mom, but also other members of her family. My favorite story, um, one of my many favorites, is from Kristen here. She was a, a mom who was a fifth grader, and the fifth grader really showed an interest, and she started running with her mom because she thought it was cool. And the, her teacher calls, you know, the mom, calls Kristen and says, I don't know if you know this, but your daughter just wrote the most beautiful essay about you and about how you inspire her. So this is just, you know, this mom, Kristen, was truly living into her mission, which was to be a positive role model for her daughter. So lots of great stuff that we learned from this one study. So I want to conclude here that, that you know, throughout the years that we've been doing this in energy management, what we found was that if you manage your energy and you do it well, we see other things happening. We see that as a result, people end up, some people end up losing weight. Some people end up happier, more engaged with their families, more productive at work. And these are just stories that we continuously hear over and over again. Is it all because it's a shift in the conversation and talking about energy and, and their energy and being more conscious of their energy. Other things that we've learned along the way and key drivers of change is being mission driven. You have to know where you're going and why you're doing this. If you don't, just like on a GPS, you'll get lost. So you have to have, this is something Holly really talked about yesterday as well. Having a target goal, what we call a um, training mission, but something you're, you know, you're looking to achieve that's concrete and has a, in the more immediate future. Having social support, I couldn't echo more what Holly was saying yesterday, the same stuff that she's been finding in her groups, 
we see as, as well. There's something really magical about going through this journey with 15 to 20, and this, this is the size of our groups as well, 15 to 20 people, whether they're moms or whether you go down in Orlando. There's something really magical happens about having this support network and going through this journey together. And then the energy focus, of course, um, really thinking about optimizing energy and nothing else. That's it, just optimizing your energy and all the things that you do to get there. And the idea of um, specifically about recovery, breaking linearity throughout your day and spending a couple minutes to recover in the microburst, these small intentional activities that you do to get a lot more energy back. And then this idea, you know, to take it one step further, wouldn't it be cool if um, we could kind of become very attuned to our own barometers? So we're attuned to our hunger, right? When we feel hungry, we instinctively know to go out and get food, right? Imagine what's possible is if we became so attuned to our energy levels that it worked the same way. When I'm feeling low in energy, I instinctively know, you know what, I need to do a microburst or I need to do something to manage my energy. Um, and we've seen this, it's fascinating, is we've done ethnography studies. There's studies where you just kind of look at energy levels um, throughout the day and we built a soft, a little texting tool um, with different populations. We've looked at these moms of the young babies and we've looked at diabetics and allergy sufferers and all kinds of, and we ping them throughout the day as kind of a, to get the data. No intervention, we just kind of want to know what is, what is energy like in people's lives. And what we found was at the end of those studies, people tell us that simply being more aware of your energy had a huge effect. So they started to change their own behaviors and started to connect the dots. Like, oh wow, you know, I, um, I went to the gym this morning and that's why my energy is higher in the afternoon, or whatever it was. They were starting to connect the dots. So simply becoming more aware and more attuned. Um, and then the last point I wanna make is, you know, we, we're not weight loss experts. It's not something we do and we focus on. But I wonder what, would ha what could happen is if we took an energy approach and we combined it with a best in class weight loss program and really focused on that as the goal, what could happen? And I think there could be significant benefits to be had there. So I think that's, that's the, uh, the last slide. Yes? Um, specifics, and maybe it's difficult sure. to nail down, but how many times a day would be ideal yeah. to get up and move around for how long and to do what? Yeah. I mean, other than just stretching. <laughs> and, and I'll give you an example. I, I find that I, I flag in the afternoons and I've started sometimes walking around this college campus quadrangle. Uh, I had no idea how long to do it. And of course I came back and had a cup of coffee immediately, which yeah. I thought was sort of you know, doubled uh, down on. <coughs> but so, I, so I had the right idea, but yeah. or do you have guidelines on how long and to do what and yeah. how many times a day? Yeah, it's a great question. We don't have any absolute guidelines and as you can imagine, everyone's different. So I think there's two parts to it. One is become more aware of your own energy rhythm. Um, and, and maybe even take a couple days and track it yourself. And we built a texting tool, I'm happy to share it if you kind of want. And uh, what we do is we ping people five times a day just to kind of get that curve. But the idea is just become aware throughout the day of what your own personal energy feels like. I think that'll be a lot. And then, so that's the <coughs> same question that we were trying Excuse to answer me. with our Organizations in Motion program. How long and how often and what do you do? So for that, what we did was we did create a structure because we wanted to replicate it at a variety of different employer sites. So there we advocated every 30 to 90 minutes, about an hour, every hour, you get up and move, or you break linearity, whatever you happen to be doing. Um, and it, you know, it's, if you think about, the best way to think about it is if you think about energy in the multiple, the four dimensions, right? The physical, the mental, the spiritual, and the emotional. The idea is just to shift. So if you're, um, for example, if you're a nurse, and we've worked with nurses, nurses have the opposite problem. They're on their feet running around all day. So their recovery isn't going up and down stairs. <laughs> their recovery is um, sitting, perhaps, or um, an emotional recovery, because they're doing some intense things and taking <coughs> a couple minutes to emotion, like the one minute meditation, which is why I love that idea. So maybe if you're draining yourself in the physical, you can recover in a different dimension. And that will work out. So it's experimentation. And what I always say is, you know, our bodies are our own laboratories. So you've got to try it out. You've got to, you know, experiment with yourself and try different things and see what works for you. Hmm. Yeah, we don't have a great, a great answer for it quite yet. <laughs> yeah. I have a couple questions. Um, the first is, have you 
looked at maybe measuring um, cortisol levels throughout the day, like through their yeah. saliva, to sort of get a more accurate gauge of their energy. And my second question is, is a lot of people have reported a lot of success with uh, high intensity interval training. Yeah. Does that fit into your research on microdose? Yeah, good question. So. Um, I've measured cortisol and saliva in a past life, in a past project when I was studying stress. So not in the context of energy, actually. We've never um, done that in the context of, context of energy. So I'm not quite sure how they're related, to be quite honest with you. So I don't know. Um, the only data I have is with the perceived stress scale, which looks at perceived stress over a longer period of time. And we've shown shifts with the holistic intervention that way. Um, your second question. Oh, high intensity. Oh, high intensity. Yes, yeah. So our um, seven-minute workout is based off of high-intensity interval training. And so when um, Chris Jordan, who developed that program, kind of has been integral in our research here as well. Um, I lo personally, I love it. But I think I love the answer that um, Sharita, I think, gave yesterday. That if it's something you like and if it's something that works for you, that's great. And if it's not, that's not. I think Robert Thayer probably has the best research around this area. So. One of the research that he did, he looked at intensity of exercise. <coughs> and what he found, if I'm remembering it right, was short bouts, you know, up until a certain time of exercise is very energizing. So the few minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I forget where the cutoff is. Um, but if you do it for too long, if you exert yourself for too long, really high intensity, like a hard workout, it's draining. You walk out and you're not feeling good. You're like, oh. So there is a drop off to the energy. But what he found was, yes, it's draining in the short term, but an hour later, those people end up higher. Mm -hmm. they, they kind of recover and rebound. So I think their body gets depleted and then they, they come back. So that's the data I know of in terms of intensity and energy. What was the individual's name again? Robert Thayer, T-H-A-Y-E-R. Oh, go ahead. Um, I'm come. Are you, have plans doing Moms in Motion anywhere else in the country? Yes, I do. This is my passion project. Uh, where, um, where all are you doing next? So I'm trying to. You know, <coughs> excuse me. Johnson and Johnson is a big <laughs> corporation, and so I'm trying to get and you know keep that momentum going with that. So we're we're trying to figure. out, I mean, we have the same. Um, we're grappling with the same types of issues that Holly kind of mentioned yesterday with scale. So right now, you know, their physical locations and the limiting factor right now is their team leaders. They, you know, they organize, organize around team leaders. And I think the team leader plays a critical role. Um, and so what we're, what we're doing, working with them, we're just talking with them on how to expand this. And we're also tinkering with the idea of a virtual version, like Holly mentioned too. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the research and there's not strong research to suggest that that will work. Um, there's something very special about accountability face to face. You know, mm -hmm. if someone that I've never met in San Francisco is emailing me going, hey, did you run? I just delete. <laughs> <laughs> Leave me alone. Who are you? I don't know. Excuse I don't know. Me. We're trying to build short answers. We're trying to figure it out. So we'll see. Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And in terms of the, the workplace sites, have yeah. you have you thought about following up to see if there have been any weight loss effects or, oh, or how much has changed their behavior? No, we don't term? measure weight, actually. Okay. Yeah, we don't measure weight. We don't look at weight loss. Um, so so have, have they kept it up, the energy bars? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I know New Balance was a big, and they, they went in full, full on. They were a great partner. So I don't know. I think, um, I think what I've heard, I haven't personally stayed with them to see. I think what I've heard is yes, that they do. Um, what I know anecdotally is that when people go through our corporate athlete training, um, the HPI training, um, they almost everyone takes something away from it. So some people end up transforming their whole lives. You know, I hear stories, oh my God, I lost, lost 50 pounds and I completely overhauled it. But most people, their experience is they take, they learn something. So whether it's the eating part or the, you know, they get something out of it. And that thing stays with them over time. But I mean, there, it's, the problem with our industry is long-term engagement. You know, it's easy to get people to do something in the short term. <coughs> it's tough to get them to stick with it. So it's, it, we struggle with it, to be honest, because they, they come out of our training and they're like super motivated. Yes, I'm totally gonna do this. And then a few months go by and the reality is life sets in. Yeah. So it's tough. Yeah, we struggle with them. We still have to crack them. Yeah. I wonder if you've ever looked at the sort of collective energy Yes. You go into some workplaces and they're vibrant and sort of energizing, and others are sluggish and slow, and it just, you know, you get this kind of lethargic feeling just walking in there. I mean, is there, yeah. 
some effect of the workplace on the energy level of the individual workers? Yeah, I'm sure there is. We haven't um, studied that in a very rigorous way, to be honest. Yeah, the culture definitely plays a role. We haven't done a focused study just to understand that. Yeah, so I don't know. I know that consistently we see the same type of pattern, and there is research to suggest in the fatigue world, um, which I don't think is exactly the antithesis to, to energy. It's the exact opposite, but it's related. Um, there's, there seem that they think that fatigue does run on a biologically set rhythm in an opposite way than what we're seeing. Um, so there might be a biological nature to that rhythm. So what I'm saying is I think that people naturally, you know, are, are set to kind of follow this energy pattern for whatever reason. But other than that, how much your environment plays a role, I'm sure it plays a big role. We've just never studied that. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, kind of along the same lines, have you looked at, I noticed that, that a lot of the uh, participants in the Moms in Motion uh, didn't work outside the house. Have you looked at whether there's differences in the energy patterns for people who are you know, office workers or nurses or you know, yeah. moms? Actually, the majority of our moms um, were working. Oh. I forget the percentage. That, that was a big percentage. It was, it was more a big than percent. half. Yeah, it was more than half were working. Because I, I was wondering that, too. One blue was not outside the home, and the other was 30 plus hours. I see. I'm sorry to distinguish. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's a really valid question. And when we looked at our moms and the young babies, I mean, they were still on maternity leave. So, um, you know, their energy patterns were different, but I think it's because they weren't sleeping and their babies were waking up. So that, that's a whole, you'll find out. <laughs> oh, gosh. Are you sure you want to know? I can't remember. It was a little bit more, um, it was deflated. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think there, yeah, I do think. <coughs> I think your instincts are right. I just don't have the data to, to prove it out. But I think you're probably right. Yeah, that it, it, your environment will play a big role in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Ariana Huffington has, is yeah. a huge proponent of napping and is trying to get, you know, kind of oh, starting yeah? a nap movement across America. Oh, interesting. And I have to look so at that. she's a huge proponent, as are others, of nap rooms in the workplace. Oh, I love and that. And so this would actually be curious if there was a, an actual space for either for napping or for or for stretching, and you know, so you don't have yeah. to do that like necessarily at your desk. I love that. Have you that. looked into those? You know, I want options? I want Disney to have nap rooms in their parks, oh. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool. so, but then they would be able to sell as many rooms. <laughs> <laughs> like, do the family rooms, but yeah, I think, but it's not specifically. Yeah, it's not specific. yeah. I, yeah I, I think it's a really great idea. I know at our workplace, uh, um, obviously we're all in, <laughs> so we had an energy room. We converted one of energy. our conference rooms into an energy room, mm -hmm. and we had a couple walking desks, we had a stationary bike, we had bouncy balls, um, um, that kind of stuff, and we would regularly hold meetings there. Mm -hmm. The only downside, the only the only um, side effect is that when you're on a call and you're on a stationary bike or something, that you're kind of talking <laughs> like this. <laughs> so it's a little weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, but everyone knew what you were doing, and, and it was all it was all good. Um, but I love the idea. Yeah, I love the idea of having a devoted space. I think one of the critical elements in the workplace, um, any kind of wellness program that you do, and I'm sure John, you, you could attest to this too, is. The, one of the most critical elements is that you have to have management buy in and fully support and live and walk the walk and support and you know having a devoted room is a way to show that this is okay um, to do and we are fully supportive of it um, if you don't feel like you have permission to do this stuff um, if you feel like you need to be at your desk and your computer going 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 because the boss were you know to, were to walk by it's not going to work, so I don't care how many wellness programs you advocate. If you're not walking the walk and, and giving permission, um, it's not going to work. So I love that idea. Yeah. yeah. I've been to several workplaces that have had, uh, like the Los Angeles Times had um, workout rooms. Uh, yeah. they had, they, first of all, they had a gym on site, and secondly, yeah. they would have yoga at lunchtime wow. and um, after. And uh, so that was one thing. And then this other workplace had, I. You know, the complete fitness program where you you can go on walks during lunch and yeah. a healthy healthy eating choices kind of integrating what we were talking about yesterday. So yeah. it is happening. It's just yeah. Not, I mean, in J and J, we've really embraced this because we're kind of training all of our our goal is to train all of our in, internal employees, all one hundred and twenty two thousand of them, um, in the energy management. So we're slowly kind of rolling it out. And I've heard from a number of different groups 
that, you know, the, the cute little strategies that they've been using. I saw a video of um, one group, I forget what state they were in, they, were, they would take um, breaks as a, as a whole, so you know, they would set a timer and when it went off, they would all turn on the radio and they would you know, dance around, they would do a lap <laughs> around their, their office and then I'll sit down and do a quick microburst like that. Or another group would have um, twice a day, um, someone would get up with a cowbell <laughs> and ring it and then everybody would stand up and do a couple minutes of stretch and then they would all sit down. <laughs> so yeah, there's little strategies. It's kind of trial and error. You gotta see and what works with your culture um, and see what works and what doesn't. I, I know, did people know about instant recess? Mm. Um, I've heard so, about this. so Tony Yancey, who, who died last year, was a huge proponent of, of mm -hmm. getting more activity into the workplace and created these, these short five to 10 minute easy workouts, some of them are dancey, some of them are more just like getting up and moving, some are stretching, and oh. the whole, her whole vision is that, is that all adults take these, these recess breaks. I love it. What, wow. what's, what was her name? Tony, Tony Yancey. Yancey. Tony, is it a man? It's a woman. woman. Tony Yancey. Wow. So, Makes in response sense to that, I have to say that our workplace at NPF has tried this concept of getting people together once or twice during the day when people are feeling a little bit low energy, and we weren't sure, okay, now we want to we want to try to do something to raise our energy level, what should we do? And we happen to have a wonderful intern who is from South Korea. And she said, well, I can show you the video of what the South Korean children do every morning before they start school. Mm -hmm. This is their standard workout, and it's 15 minutes, so it's a little longer than a microburst. Jenny's going to play it for you. Oh, you good. Yeah. <laughs> during, during the break, we'll play it so you can yeah. get a sense of it. But this sounds maybe if it's yeah, shorter. Yeah, you, can, you it might can just Google Instagram. Yeah. 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 But we do love our Korean workout. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, 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 it's very fun. And that, and that recess just gives that idea of play and permission, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Um, I had another question. I, I think a couple of years ago there's some research out of maybe University of North Carolina, and it got some press at the time around the idea that you can get just as big a benefit from a brief workout several times a day yes. as from, you know, and you talked about the fact that even, and, and some of our other speakers have talked about the fact that even if you work out for an hour in the morning, if you're sitting for the next seven hours, it's still bad for your health. Yeah. And so this research showed that if you work out, like if you do three 20 minute workouts, yep. you get just as big a health I think it's boost. in one of my footnotes, that particular study. There's a, it's growing research. I think oh, I have like two or three in there. I can't remember which one, but they're in there if you want to look them up. Absolutely. And I know Dr. Levine will probably elaborate even more. He's more of the expert on that than I am. Yep. Great. It seems that it's more sustainable from what, you know, from what we're hearing hearing and seeing here that it is more sustainable throughout your day if you do the shorter burst because that, that long workout isn't going to take you through. Yeah, and it's easier because you can ask someone, you know, go to the gym for an hour and go, oh, it's, you can come up with a billion excuses. <laughs> but you can tell someone, one to two minutes. It's hard to come up with an excuse, one to two <laughs> minutes, mm -hmm. right? And what I love is not only the physical benefits but the mental benefits, and I think that's huge, the effect on mood. Um, I think that's huge. That's really a whole other area. Anybody else have questions? Okay, Dr. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much.